It's time to get your music radio ready with the Audio Skills Podcast. It doesn't matter what type of music you're creating or what gear you use. It's all about the technique. Get ready to turn your home studio into a place where your music goes platinum. Now give it up for your host, Scott Hawksworth. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Scott with you for yet another edition of the Audio Skills Podcast. I am so stoked for our show this week, as we're going to be talking mixing with someone whose mixing books and video instruction have influenced many, many people in the audio world, myself included. Bobby Osinski, author, educator, producer, and engineer, will be our guest, and I can't wait to pick his brain for some mixing advice. But before I get into all of that, I wanted to start with the audio tip of the week. And at Audio Skills, I want to give people actionable takeaways with everything that we do, whether it's a YouTube video tutorial, an article I've written, or one of my audio FAQ emails that I send out every Friday to our email newsletter subscribers. And this podcast is no different. So with that in mind, my tip this week has to deal with parallel processing, and it's a simple recommendation. Make use of parallel processing in your mixes. Even if you're an absolute beginner, you should consider using it. Now, you know that mixing is the art of subtlety, and parallel processing is a much gentler way to add effects or compression, for example, to a track, and that's one reason I love it so much. Okay, so if you are unaware of what parallel processing is, don't worry. For the beginners, real quick, here's what it is. You have your audio signal for an individual track, your input, your output. Normally, you may put effects like reverb or delay right onto that track as plugins. You might do the same for compression. You might put compression right onto that track. Parallel processing is all about creating an auxiliary track, which you then send the main signal to, which creates a copy of it. What you can then do is add effects to that auxiliary track that you've created, the copy. And what's happening when you do that is the signal is being processed in parallel or alongside the original signal, which doesn't have the effect on it. You can then blend these tracks together by controlling the amount of the signal you're sending to the auxiliary track and the volume of each and things like that. And this is a great way to add effects without overpowering things. It's a great way to thicken things up or get a better blend for your mix. If you're worried about overcompressing or, you know, drowning your mix in reverb, for example, then adding some compression or reverb on an auxiliary track can be a great solution. This is also a great thing to do if you want to share effects across multiple tracks. I'm a big fan of that because it cuts down on processing power that's required. So there it is. The bottom line is make use of the power of parallel processing. It is something that all the pros do and they do it well and it works wonders for them. So no matter what your skill level is or what kind of music you're making, try it out. And I think you'll be happy with the results as you get better with it. So moving on to our guest interview for this week, I am so honored to introduce Bobby Osinski. Bobby has just had an incredible career. He's worked as a producer, engineer with all kinds of recording artists on commercials, TV, and motion pictures as well. He has audio and music courses. He's taught at Berkeley College of Music, Treybos Recording Institute, Nova Institute, And perhaps most notable are his accomplishments as an author in the music recording industry with 23 books that are used in music, music business, and audio recording programs all over the world. One of my personal favorites of these books is his Mixing Engineers Handbook, which is so incredibly helpful. And I read it, you know, when I was first starting out, and I recommend anyone trying to improve their skills or learn this stuff checks it out. And lastly, he also has a podcast he hosts, the Inner Circle podcast where he talks with music industry pros and he runs a number of great audio sites including the Bobby Osinski music production blog. Whew. So Bobby, welcome. Thanks for having me, Scott. 
I love that intro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no, good. it's. I feel like I could almost dedicate a whole show just listing off the things you've done with regards to audio. Yeah, it makes me feel old. <laughs> well, I think it's it makes you distinguished. <laughs> I like that word better. <laughs> so how are things now? You're in LA, correct? Yes, I'm in Burbank, California. How are things in Burbank these days? Well, the beauties of living in Burbank is it's an industry town. I can mm -hmm. walk out my front door I can walk to Warner Brothers, both Warner Pictures and Warner Records. I can walk to Universal, to Disney, to ABC, NBC, DreamWorks, and probably there's some others I can't think of, and a host of post-production and big-time recording studios all in my neighborhood. So you would think, you know, Studio City is not that far away, but Studio City has nothing on Burbank. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's the heart of it all down there, for sure. So... I guess to, to start us off, can you just, I guess, tell us a little bit more about, you know, maybe a little bit more about your career and, and what projects you're currently working on? Okay. Well, I started like everybody else as a musician. I still think of myself first and foremost as a musician and a producer. Mm -hmm. And I always come from that mindset rather than as a recording engineer or a mixer. I like to do that. That's, that's a big part of what I do. But, you know, I also have that producer vibe in me that kind of never leaves. Yeah. And, you know, as a result, I've worked on a lot of different things mm -hmm. during my career. I was a touring musician, a guitar player, sometimes keyboard player until I was kind of in my early 40s. And... Then it was like, well, I, you know, I don't like this anymore. <laughs> I'm just going yeah. to stay in the studio. And that's what I did for a long, long time until I started to write more and do video courses and things like that. So I still work on projects. I actually had a couple of minor hits over the last few years. One was got to number two on the Billboard Blues charts, Adriana Marie and her Blues Cutters. Right on. And that was cool. And then I had another number six on the iTunes rock charts not that long ago. So I still do projects. And I've been waiting to start an album project since January. And it mm -hmm. keeps on getting pushed off and pushed off and pushed off. So as a result, I really haven't done much in the studio lately because I've been waiting for this project to begin. And it's just, <laughs> it's having a hard time getting going. <laughs> yeah, that happens sometimes. Th this is because there's someone in the band that's having some family problems. Ah, uh, yeah. People in the family that are sick and stuff like that and, and and not in this country. So it's making it very difficult to get everybody together to, to do it. So, you know, it's one of those things you can't really blame it on a record label or, you know, the typical reasons why, you know, you wait real long to start in a project. It, it's right. something beyond anyone's control. For sure. So kind of to to just kind of sum it up, you've obviously have your hands in a lot of different areas and, and throughout your career, you've done a lot of different things. And, you know, what fascinates me so much is specifically, you know, your writing and the education side of things. You know, you've got courses, you've taught on, on Linda and, and elsewhere. And, you know, you also have 101 mixing tips and tricks that I've watched it. It's just amazing. And a lot of people are out there and they're wanting to get better results from their mixes. And they are like, you know, hey, do you have any tips? You know, how can I apply this to my music? If you could give just one best, quote unquote, mixing tip to help someone get better results, what would that tip be? Oh, for sure. It would be figuring out three volumes to mix at. And... Usually people, will they'll find a place where they like to mix at. They'll set it, be it loud or soft, doesn't matter. They find that one spot. And then they'll, mm -hmm. they'll keep on changing the level up and down and up and down. And it kind of ruins your reference point. So really, there should be three reference levels that you should have. One is just, you know, a medium level that's very comfortable to you, that you can do the majority of your, your mixing decisions, make your, your decisions at that level. Mm -hmm. But... You also have to turn it up loud at a certain point in order to hear the low end. And it doesn't have to be long, only a few minutes, but you have to be able to go up loud to hear that mm -hmm. low end. 
And it was a mistake I made for a long, long time, to be honest with you. I just wasn't listening loud enough. And then the final level would be when you are just about finished with the mix, come down as low as you possibly can. And then the balances will show up and you'll be able to hear where there's too much of something and not enough of another. And at that point, you should be able to balance everything out so it translates across any kind of reproductive playback system. Mm -hmm. So that would be the biggest thing. It would be finding those levels, those comfortable levels, those three levels. And that goes so far. It's such a simple thing, but it goes so far in, in helping your mixes. So that that's the, the big thing that comes to mind right off. Yeah, no, that's an, that's an awesome, awesome tip. And it's something that, you know, I, I think uh, sometimes people might yeah, like you were saying, you know, bounce around too much or or maybe they're they're listening super loud the whole time, which can be pretty counterproductive because, you know, sometimes louder isn't always better and you might be thinking that you're doing something when it's like, well, maybe it's not gonna your balance isn't gonna be there if you're not listening to it when it's quieter. Yeah, I mean we all like it when it's loud. You know, it's very exciting. <laughs> and it's not terribly exciting when it's not really loud sometimes, but that's the whole trick. If you can make it exciting when it's quiet, then you've really done a good job. Absolutely. So in the Mixing Engineer's Handbook and, and elsewhere, you've talked about the importance of developing the groove in a mix. And this was something that was really kind of impactful to me when I read it, because I just it was something that for whatever reason, I had never really, I guess, conceptualized that like, yeah, okay, groove. Can you kind of explain what the groove is and, and maybe share you know, a tip or two on how one might go about developing it? Yeah, it's actually fairly easy, or I can make it fairly easy. The groove is the pulse of the song. So the way you develop it is you find the main instrument that is actually contributing the most to that pulse. Mm -hmm. It could be the drums, it usually is, but sometimes it's the bass, sometimes it's percussion, and oftentimes it might be like a rhythm guitar. So you have to find whatever feels the best in terms of just the pulse of the song and moving the song along. And that's establishing your groove and everything has to go around that. So if you figure out what that is and you kind of build around it, then you find that your track feels better. And if you find that you mix that down lower in the track, then it doesn't feel as good because you're not emphasizing the, the groove. So, you know, again, it's actually fairly simple when I talk about it, if I tell you what it is, but going in and finding it sometimes isn't quite as easy. And it's, it's there are many times it's very obvious. It'll jump right out at you and, and you'll go, wow, okay, that's it right there. And mm -hmm. there are other times you'll scratch your head and you'll go, uh, is it this or is it this? And that's a little harder. Usually when that happens, it means that you really don't have something that's establishing the groove really well and maybe you missed it when you're recording or some whoever's recording i kind of missed it and and really something else has to lock in so it's a lot harder at that point but you know if you've captured some you know a really good groove at least on one of the instruments then you're in pretty good shape yeah so the groove is basically and, and please correct me if i if i'm wrong in thinking this but is it almost that thing that when you're listening to a, a song, it, it makes you kind of, you know, nod your head or, or tap your foot or you're like, oh man, I, I'm really feeling this. Yeah. I mean, it's more than tempo. It's more than yeah. just keeping time. It's the pulse of the song. And again, if you know, you're thinking about tempo and, and especially music that has to do with loops and, and samples mm -hmm. and stuff like that, where it's to a grid, you'll find that when you have something that has just an incredible groove that it doesn't necessarily perform well to a grid, it speeds up and it slows down, but it does it in a way where it feels good. It does it at the right times to bring. And, and, and this is a trick that we've used in the studio, you know, for a while, not just me, but everybody where if you're doing something to a loop or you're doing something to a click, you program mm -hmm. those speed variations in those small speed variations where maybe it goes up a BPM or two during a chorus or a bridge or something like that. And then it comes back down for a verse. So, you know, you have those slight timing differences that contribute to the groove and, you know, the way a real player would do it. 
So, that, you know, there's all these little tricks to actually help you, you know, in those situations. And then, of course, there's sometimes people are such good programmers that, you know, they can get it right on the grid and it still feels good. So that happens, too. Absolutely. And that's and that's such a good point you make about, you know, how people actually play, because if you are watching a band live, you know, and they're really getting into it. Yeah. You know, the tempo might pick up a little bit and recreating that in a studio environment, which, you know, if you're mixing or recording, you're essentially trying to, you know, capture the best of, of what every single performance is, what it would be the ideal performance. Right. That's that makes a ton of sense to me. Yeah, you know, again, sometimes easier said than done, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what we try to do. We try to capture that groove. We keep it's why sometimes you'll do, you know, dozens and dozens of takes on something or 100 I mean, it it's not uncommon to do 100 takes on a song. Mm-hmm. Until you finally get something that that's right. It's not much fun to do, but eventually you're going to get there. Yeah, sometimes capturing lightning takes some time, <laughs> yeah, yeah. as it were. So now a lot of people, and especially those working in home studio environments and you know audio skills listeners and subscribers, they're, they're constantly asking about this. They're frustrated because they're like, my mix isn't loud enough. And they're saying, you know, I just don't know what, how to get it louder. Can you share any advice or tips for just creating a louder mix? Sure, it's easy. But first of all, let me say that having a loud mix is no longer necessary because Mm -hmm. if it's going to go on any kind of streaming distribution service, Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, it doesn't matter what it is, they all normalize the level. It all comes out to be the same level anyway. It has nothing, nothing to do with the way you deliver it. They if it's too quiet, they'll boost it up. And if it's too loud, they'll bring it down. So it all plays at the same level. And by crushing a mix, you're actually hurting yourself because it sounds worse under those situations. But that being said, if somebody wants a really loud mix, you have to do what the mastering engineers do. And I learned at the feet of some great mastering engineers back in the analog days. And the way it's done Analog and digitally is fairly the same. It's a little more complex digitally, but it, it's basically the same idea. Mm-hmm. So what it is is you have at least two processors. One is a compressor, and then there's a limiter. The compressor yes. comes first, and that goose it brings your level up. So you turn that, and you don't need a lot of compression. You know, when I watch mastering engineers, they're if it's two dB, it's a lot. They're not adding a lot. Mm-hmm but they're goosing the level quite a bit. And what's stopping it from overloading is the limiter, especially a good digital look-ahead limiter. That's important. So what'll happen is you'll set that at minus 0.1, minus 0.2, minus 0.3, or even you know under certain circumstances a little lower, mm-hmm. and it won't go over that with the, the look-ahead limiter. So that's what you do. You, you get your level from the compressor, the limiter stops any overloads, there you go. Now, you, now, that being said, in the digital age, what I see mastering engineers doing today is they'll use multiple limiters or multiple compressors. So if you look at their signal path, there might be five or six of them in there. And just a tiny hair of each, they're not doing much. They're just, they're all doing a little bit. And that's one of the techniques that's used in, let's say, modern mastering. Hmm. Yeah, so just kind of stacking it a bit. Yeah. Interesting. Now, okay, so this is another one. And, you know, reverb is one of those things that can be so great when it's used well and executed well in a mix. But I know, and especially folks who might be newer to all of this, it can be a disaster if it's used poorly or, you know, way overdone. Do you have like any great advice for getting good results from using reverb? Sure. Again, that's fairly easy. And we're going back to techniques that were developed in the 1960s, really. Mm -hmm. The problem that you usually have is there's too much reverb. It just, everything sounds like it's drenched in reverb. Yeah. And as a result, all the tracks seem like to push back in the mix. 
Well, if you go back and you listen to a lot of the tracks from the 60s and the 70s, they're the same way. They're drenched in reverb, but it doesn't sound like it. It, it, it just sounds good. But if you were to isolate the tracks, you'd be shocked. There, or, or if there's a, a hole in, in the mix where everything stops, that the reverb holds over, you'd be shocked at the amount of reverb that's on these things. Okay, why does, this, why does this sound good in one case and not in another? Well, it's the sound of the reverb. And what the smart engineers found, and studio owners, it really started with the studio owners, what they found going way, way back in the 60s is that if you EQ your reverb, you make it sound better and you can use a lot more, and it just glues everything together without sounding bad. So what does that mean? Well, it means rolling off the top end. So right. usually you roll that off, so it could be 10K, 8K, 6K, something like that. I've seen it down all the way to 2K, as a matter of fact. Wow, just drums. rolling all of that off, huh? Yeah. And on the low end, especially low end, may be more critical and you're rolling off to, well, three, four, 500 cycles. And at Abbey road, they do it at 610 K. And mm -hmm. when you listen to those records, those classic records that came out of Abbey road, they're drenched in reverb, but it just sounds good. You never notice it. It's just a glue. The reason why is the reverb is EQ'd. And you put the EQ before the reverb. That's a big deal. You'd think that, it, well, how does it, how does it matter, you know, whether it's before or after? Well, yeah, you're energizing the reverb differently if you EQ it beforehand. And as a result, it sounds different. It sounds it sounds better, and that's you know what you hear on those records. So if you want reverb that just acts as a glue, and you don't really notice so much, or you mm -hmm. notice it only in the spaces, that's how you do it. Wow, <laughs> it's funny because that that is it's so simple, and these are these are techniques that were you know discovered decades ago, but still very very relevant, and still can get great results. And if you're not doing that, you know maybe that's why your reverb is is sounding pretty bad. One thing, Scott, I want to make clear is, you know, it's not that I'm such a genius in all this. I've learned on the backs of giants. I mean, I've interviewed and I've sat in mixes with the greatest mixers in the world. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote the Mixing Engineer's Handbook, it was because I was a terrible mixer. I was a good engineer. I was good re at recording. But my mixes just, you know, they, they were flat. They were they weren't great. So I thought, well, wait a second. I, I want to find out. And I know all these guys. I know all the best guys. Let me just find find out what they do. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, I figured, well, if I want to know this, then maybe a whole lot of other people do. And, and thankfully they did. But it's not because I'm that smart. It's just I know people that are smart. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's why, you know, it's so exciting, you know, talking with someone like yourself and, you know, other people that we've had on Audio Skills because, there's always someone out there who either has maybe more experience than you or, you know, they've figured something out or they've tried something in a new way. And what you can do is you can learn that, learn that technique or, or, or what have you, and then apply it to your own mixes. Or if, if you decide, you know what, this technique really doesn't work for what I'm trying to do. Okay. At least you, you know what it's about. And, and, you know, really when it comes to audio, we are all standing on the shoulders of those who have blazed the trails before and figured a lot of this stuff out. And, and there's still people figuring things out today, especially as technology and, and new plugins and all these kinds of things keep coming out. No, I think that's a, that's a really great point. I wish I could say that there are things that are progressing in terms of recording, but in many mm -hmm. cases we're regressing in terms of recording and mixing. Mostly because there's so many choices that we can make. Right. As a result, you find that instead of taking a simple approach, which, which would work better, the approach becomes more complex only because we can, not because it's better. So I, I'll give you an example. Yeah. I, I have a really good friend, and he's won uh, 15, 16 Grammys, something like that. Good friend, one of my oldest friends. And he mostly mixes these days, but he has a studio and Britney Spears 
lives in the neighborhood and she didn't want to go into Hollywood to record her vocals. So she arranged to come into his studio. So it was the first time he's recorded vocals in a while. Mm -hmm. So he puts up his beautiful C12 into uh, 1073, into an oh, yeah. L2-way, and just the, the finest, best signal path you can think of. So Brittany, for every one of her songs, all 10 songs has a different producer or producers. Yeah. And the first one comes in and sets up the Pro Tools rig, and Brittany starts to sing, and my friend goes pale. And he goes, why does it sound so bad? Oh my God, what happened? Is a C12 bad? Mm -hmm. And But everybody seems to be happy, so he just goes with the flow. <laughs> right. <laughs> so later on, he's looking at the signal path on Pro Tools, and he finds out that there's five plugins on oh. the input on the signal path. And a lot of them are doing the opposite. One is boosting at 5K, and then there's another one that's that's dipping at 5K, you know? <laughs> Gosh. And and there's a compressor and an expander and it's all this crazy stuff. So he goes in and he bypasses all of them and there's the beautiful sound again. Right. So every day a different producer came in with a different template, a different signal path, and they all had like tons of plugins. So my friend and I, you know, were having dinner one night and, and he's saying, I, I don't understand why they do this because they're just killing the sound. They're not helping it. And yet everybody seems like they're happy with it. So what, who am I to say? Well, I mean, the guys are in 16 Grammys, so <laughs> you should be able to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it just goes to show you that because they could, they did, r rather than just listening to see if that's actually helping or not, it was just, that's the way we do it. So we're doing it this way. So sometimes being able to do something doesn't mean you should do it, if you know what I mean. No, I do. That is a, a really, really great point. And, you know, one of the things I, I've tried to talk about is, yeah, you know, simplify when you can, you know, in, in all processes, you know, whether you're recording or mixing or mastering. And I think a lot of people sometimes they like expect, oh, well, there there's this perfect plugin that if I get this perfect plugin pack that I can throw all these on there and, and make these settings and that's going to fix it when, you know, maybe you just need to go back and, and keep it simple, you know, maybe have a little compression or whatever, but, you know, really let the sound be, if that makes any sense. When I first started, I started in the 8-track days, which, you know, I'm, I'm dating myself, but the, the point I'm trying to make is maybe we had two... We had one reverb, we had two compressors, didn't have much, but that's the way people made records. And there right. were some fabulous records that today still sound terrific. Mm -hmm. You go, wait a second, less has to be more because we didn't have a lot back then. And with eight tracks, you really had to have it together because you're constantly thinking ahead. I mean, you only had eight tracks, so you had to fit all that stuff on there. There was nothing in stereo ever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was just a matter, and, and you had to get your mixes right. So all the drums are on one track sometimes. Gee, if we put the kick drum on the second track, wow, that was a big deal. But it just goes to show you that, you know, those records still sound terrific and didn't have much to, to really work with. Mm -hmm. For sure. So well, I don't know if this is related to this, but you were you were touching on this before when you were talking about the different volumes and and the idea that that a great tip is to hey have have three volumes to mix at and that turning it up at some point and mixing loud can really help you get your low end right you know and a lot of people struggle with their their low end either it's overpowering or it's not powerful enough or it's just you know a muddy mess or or they're just unhappy with it beyond obviously just mixing louder which you covered do you have any other advice for maybe getting the low end better, getting better results from it? Sure. It usually means that you're not listening to reference material to mm -hmm. figure out what really works on your speakers. So just find, you know, the highest quality, meaning a CD or something of that quality that's nice and clean, and play it back, you know, uh, some songs that you just think sound terrific, play it back, listen to what the low end sounds like and try to match it. Mm-hmm. Don't go beyond that. And the more you listen to, you know, great sounding songs and 
what they sound like in your speakers, it gives you an idea of what you can and can't do. But usually it's a result of not referencing enough material to understand what your speakers are actually showing you that gets you into trouble. Right, not having that center. Yeah. I mean, it's happened to me, you know, a lot as well. And still, sometimes I'll go into a mix and I won't listen in advance. And I find every time I do that, it's like, oh, wait a second. Uh, Let's play some things and just make sure. And it does help. No, that's a great tip. And that's something that I've heard a lot of people who know quite a bit about, you know, mixing music. They say, you know, use those reference tracks because you are never... I was told this once by a woman named Trina Shoemaker. She said, you are never so good that you can't get lost and you can't lose your your kind of reference point and where where you're trying to go with the mix. So picking a reference track that you know and love and that will give you that good target is is just so key. And, and it makes sense too for, for something like getting the low end right is, yeah, find something that has gotten it right and say, okay, that's what I need to be going for here. And that's what I need to, to reach. Yep. You got it. All right. So that is actually going to do it for our interview this week. Bobby had so much fantastic advice that we just couldn't get it all in one episode. So tune in next week for part two of my discussion with Bobby Osinski. I wanted to thank Bobby for joining me on today's show, and I want to thank you so much for listening. As a reminder, for links and information about today's show and our guest, please check out our show notes at audioskills.com slash podcast. Now, wherever you are, whatever your skill level is, go out there and make some great music. Ready to go even deeper with your recording, mixing, and music production? We've got all the info and techniques you need in one place so you can turn it up. Go to audioskills.com and access a huge library of video tutorials and private workshops so you make progress even faster. Come back next week for a brand new episode of the Audio Skills Podcast. Podcast.